Welcome to the Drum Shuffle, a podcast offering insights, perspectives, and conversations for drummers. I'm your host, Jamie Eads. Hey, how's everybody doing out there? Welcome to the Drum Shuffle. Jamie Eads joining you as always. This is episode 31. Super excited today. We are going to be joined by uh, a, a young gentleman who just has groove for days, chops for days. Uh, I'm talking, of course, about the great Brendan Buckley will be joining us from the road on his world tour with Shakira. You're not going to want to miss our interview, so please stay tuned. Lost Cabos Drumsticks may be the best kept secret from drummers today. Lost Cabos Drumsticks makes the finest tools to touch a drummer's hands in the business. The best news, almost every popular stick size is available in both white hickory and red hickory. If you don't know what red hickory is, it's made from the heartwood of the hickory tree, unlike regular white hickory, which is made from sapwood. Red hickory drumsticks will hold up to even the hardest hitting drummers. Their durability comes from the density of the wood, but they do not sacrifice the feel. Please visit LosCabosDrumsticks.com to learn more about their products. And don't forget to ask at your favorite retailer for Los Cabos Drumsticks. All right, guys and girls, I think we have a highly educational interview today with the great Brendan Buckley. Um, Brendan, of course, you know him from his work with Shakira for the last uh, 19, 20 years, I want to say. Uh, But his resume speaks for itself. Not only has he been, uh, you know, recording and out on the road with Shakira for a number of years, uh, Tegan and Sarah, Shelby Lynn, the Bodines, um, Daniel Patrick. Powder, Melissa Etheridge. He's done gigs with Jackson Brown. Uh, you name it. He has been behind the drums for just a who's who of popular music. Uh, and and Brendan just has so many great insights to share. We're just so thrilled to have him on the show this week and such a cool guy. So help me welcome to the drum shuffle, Brendan Buckley. Brendan, how's it going today, man? It's going Great. Thanks for calling. Oh, yeah, thanks for coming on the drum shuffle. We certainly appreciate your time. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure. I'd love to be part of this. So thanks for even thinking of me. Oh, absolutely. Um, Brendan, you know, what we typically do here on the show is we we go back to the beginning. Um, so I will ask, tell our listeners how you ended up behind a drum set to begin with. Uh, OK, so that's sort of the beginning, beginning. So, uh, let's see. I, I think it's a story that's not too dissimilar from a lot of other drummers out there, but maybe I started on some other instruments. Like when I was a kid, I took piano lessons. I played trumpet in the school orchestra, things like that. But when I was a kid also, MTV was really big. Rock and roll was huge. And, uh, I used to watch a lot of videos on TV and, I didn't see a whole lot of piano and trumpet in these videos. <laughs> and, and I said, you know what? I want to be in a band. Maybe I should pick a third instrument. So uh, I chose drums and I started playing drums a little bit here or there. And then I bought a used drum set off of a neighbor. And um, that's it. I, and that, that just kind of took off and I never looked back. So, um, you know, I, I practiced on my own at first kind of self-taught and then uh at a certain point uh took drum lessons and at a certain point just got more serious more serious and then um went to a music school and then kept on going well it's my understanding you know and all of our listeners or the great majority of them are drummers they're going to recognize one of your teacher's names you you took lessons and studied with the great tommy igo right Absolutely. I'm still friends with him. We, we texted yesterday and, uh, he was pretty integral with my, uh, my, uh, my, where I am today. Cause, uh, basically I was, uh, playing drums self-taught and I probably started when I was 14 years old and I knew a little bit 
uh, from being able to read music and being able to watch, you know, Van Halen videos and figuring out how to put my right hand on the hi hat <laughs> and my left hand on the snare and playing boom cha, boom boom cha, and also uh, playing in the school jazz band and going ting ting ka ting ting ka ting ting ka ting. But you know, at a certain point, I can only go so far before I thought there were other guys in my neighborhood in my uh, vicinity that could play circles around me like uh, drummers that were like three years ahead of me I couldn't figure out how they were doing all this these uh, licks and beats and stuff so um, I mean specifically I remember going over a friend's house once and he was playing me uh, uh, Good Times Bad Times by Zeppelin with those uh, uh, offbeat triplet kicks oh yeah you know and I was like how is that possible to do that and the guy was like dude I have a drum teacher he showed me how to do that <laughs> drum teacher that's what that's my missing thing I need a drum teacher now so I went to my band instructor his name was uh, Daryl Bott this amazing um, conductor guy in high school and I said you know what I need a drum teacher I've decided I'm, I'm going to bite the bullet I'm going to stop being too proud and I'm going to admit that I am sucking and I need a drum teacher so he said I'm going to hook you up with a guy so he was friends with Tommy Igo first and he brought him to our school and kind of this and kind of sold the idea of him teaching our entire like drum section the the, the percussion ensemble the jazz band the marching band and all I wanted to do was learn how to play you know cool rock and punk beats and stuff but to study with him I had to sign up for everything I had to do the jazz band orchestral drumming, timpani, xylophone, marching band, the whole thing. Yeah. And at first I was a, I was a little reluctant because uh, really I was just you know listening to heavy metal and hardcore and things like that. But I decided to do it and it was a great decision because you know he's a real motivator, really pushed me to take it a lot more seriously. And um, I studied with him from the ages 15 to 18. Well, I mean, I mean, you couldn't have asked for a better teacher, in my opinion. I mean, Tommy is the man. I mean, he's a machine. Yeah, and he was really, we joke about it now, that he was really good for me because it was a bit like a full metal jacket. Like, he was, he's, he's a, uh, he'll admit it, he's a, he's a tough teacher, so uh, he doesn't ex- uh, um, accept, you know, mediocrity. So you have to come every week showing that you worked hard you don't have to play everything perfectly but you got to show that you worked hard for the last six days on the stuff that he assigned so uh he would show me a bunch of stuff i'd go home i'd work on it like crazy i'd come back he'd pick it apart and then we'd do it again and um and i always felt like i was doing terribly um like i can't do any of this stuff but later on, he reflected, he goes, I was amazed that you even came close to what I was assigning you. You know, I was, like, I was throwing, I was piling on as much as I could, and you'd get through like 80% of it every week. So that showed me that you, uh, you at least had the work ethic, if not the talent. So, um, so uh, yeah, that was uh, really great for that reason. Like, he didn't go, he didn't, he didn't lighten up on me. Like, I'm a, I'm a more, like, relaxed Zen kind of drum teacher and he was full on like pilot pilot on kind of drum teacher and, and I think that's what I needed back then yeah because uh, I was I was real scattered I was doing a million things I was you know playing sports and um, doing all sorts of uh, activities and like everything at you know a, a better than a mediocre level and he was uh, the one who said you know what if you want to do anything at a high level you really have to work a lot harder at it so probably the first guy to really make me focus on one thing like every day after school. Well, I mean, it's obviously it's paid massive dividends for you. Um, you know, just a, a quick glance of your resume, just performance resume, live performances. Uh, of course, you're calling me from, uh, you know, a, a day off on the Shakira World Tour. Uh, Tegan and Sarah, Shelby Lynn, the Bodines, um, uh, Adina Menzel. Um, you know, I see Scott Weiland on here. I, I mean, it's just amazing, you know, the gigs that you've had. Um, and I think that goes back. Um, you, you went to the University of Miami, the, the school of music down there, correct? Correct. When I was 18, I, I, when I graduated from high school, I went to the University of Miami for four years. 
Well, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I, I saw an interview with you somewhere where you said, you know, I got there and I went, oh, my God, all these people are really good drummers, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. and it made you raise your game even more. Of course. Yeah. When I mean, I think a lot of people experience this as they move to different larger ponds, you know, uh, you know, being the best drummer in my high school felt pretty good for about uh, 10 months. And then you go to college and you're the worst guy out of, you know, 55 drummers there. And you're like, what happened? I <laughs> just like three months ago, I was really good. <laughs> and then I realized these guys all had this amazing head start or really good teachers of their own. And uh, it's pretty crushing in the beginning, but it's also a motivator because you, you realize, wow, these guys are, we're of similar age and uh, these guys are doing incredible things. So this is possible for me if I just, put in the time and a lot of it is just having the right attitude and putting in the time and I just you know I beat myself up for a while uh, about how you know far behind I was but uh, I also use it as a motivator to try to catch up to all my peers and my friends and everything uh, so yeah and then and then the same thing happens every time you change a, um, you know an environment or a circle you go from first to last again and then you have to catch up if you change a style of music if you change a city location where you live, if you change uh, jobs or whatever, you have to say, okay, I'm going to leave my comfort zone and start over again and climb up uh, another ladder. And I kind of believe in that, you know, not, not, not um, wallowing in your comfort, but kind of putting yourself out there a little bit. Sure. Well, I, I mean, you are, um, you, you know, I, these are my words. You're a drummer's drummer, you know, certainly um, your resume speaks for itself. And, and I'll tell you something that I caught here recently that I thought was just one of the coolest things ever. Um, I believe it was in Drumhead magazine. They were doing their special snare drum uh, issue and you had shared your collection of, of snare drums and, you know, to be a, a young guy, you know, you're, you're a younger drummer. Um, your snare collection is amazing. And, you know, everything about all of them. You know what I mean? I was reading through that and I was like, man, this, this Brendan is just a cool guy. You know, I mean, you understand the history of the instrument and and, you know, all the different manufacturers. But that was something that really caught my eye. And, and honestly, one of the reasons I reached out to you and said, hey, would you like to come on the show? Oh, well, thanks. That that article was a lot of fun to do. And that's I, I've over the years become friends with Jonathan Mover. Uh, he's super cool what he does with that magazine. And he reached out to me saying, hey, we're doing this thing about snare drum collections. You want to be part of it? And I'm like, nah, that sounds not my thing, you know, I don't really believe in collecting drums just to, you know, show them off or something like that. I mean, other guys do it great, but I'm not that kind of guy, you know. And he's like, no, 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 that's not what we want. We want, we want to do like a more of a tell the stories behind your favorite snare drums. I'm like, oh, well, that sounds more interesting. Like to talk about what snare drums you own, uh, whether they're ten dollars or ten thousand dollars and tell a little story about each one i'm like that sounds a lot more interesting to me so he he wrote me in with that concept so then i i just took a, a weekend set everything in a big pile in my backyard and tried to think about where each one came from and what i like about it and like a memory that goes with each one and uh, some of them even astonish me because i'm like oh, i remember getting that from a buddy or i remember getting that at and this, I had to fix this one, or I got this one on sale, or this one I've only used once, but it was really, sounded really great in that one session I did, and it kind of made me uh, appreciate some of the ones that I haven't been using lately, and and uh, I said in that article, uh, at some point in that article, that I'm a little bit irreverent with the, the drums I own sometimes, because they could be like a quote-unquote famous snare drum, but I'll get rid of it if I haven't used it for a little while. Cause I have a lot of friends who I know would use it. So I'm like, Hey, you want to buy this? Or you want to, you know, trade with me for this? Cause I feel bad when I have like a really fancy snare drum that just sits on a shelf for, and never gets used because yeah. for some reason, for some reason, it's just, I can't find a use for it. I, I use it. It sounds too dry or too dark or too loud or too whatever. So I'm like, I bet someone else can get a lot of music out of this thing. So I should probably put it back into the, uh, into the market. And then there's other ones that are just, 
you know, could be considered a piece of junk, but for some reason it sounds really good to me and I find a good spot for it on certain overdubs or whatever. And so that, that's where my little, my little pile came from in that drumhead article. Um, so it was, a, it wound up being a lot of fun for me, you know, in the, in the end. Well, you know, I mean, I, I've been playing for, you know, 30 years now and I was even learning stuff about some of your drums. You know, I thought I knew everything. I mean, don't we all, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, but, but it, I, just the thought that you put into each drum, it's like, okay, so this one is one that's really good for, you know, kind of a lo-fi indie kind of sound, you know, and, and that's, mm-hmm. it, this is the context that I use it. I thought it was it just incredible how much knowledge you had around that collection of drums. So, you know, kudos to you for that. I I loved it. Yeah. Well, thanks. I mean, I remember, I mean, when I was back in high school and I was reading modern drummer magazines, I would read a lot of articles about the, the eighties session guys who would show up to sessions with crates of 30 snare drums to do a record. And, uh, you know, like John Robinson, Jeff Beccaro, all these guys, and, and I would read about their arsenal, the arsenal of snare drums, every <laughs> yeah. single one, every, every metal, every size, every depth, every head combination. And I'm like, wow, that's what you need to be a professional drummer. So when I started getting gigs and making money, I'd always, I'd always set aside some money to buy another drum for my arsenal. I need a brass piccolo. I need a deep maple snare drum. I need this. I need that. And then... Um, I built a huge collection and realized that I didn't like half this stuff that I owned. I just, I just bought it because I thought I was supposed to have it to be a professional drummer. Right. And then I started going through this, this second wave of, of saying to myself, man, it's more important to play things that you love or that inspire you to make music. If you, if you go to a music store and you sit down and you hit a snare drum and you go, wow, and you can't stop doing buzz rolls on it or rim shots on it or whatever, it's speaking to you. It's making you want to play it. And if uh, another snare drum might be have a famous name on it or a famous era, but you play it and you're like, hmm, I don't really see where I could use this. You know, it irritates me or I can't really get the finesse or the, the tone I want out of this one. It's not for you, even if it's a famous um, era or, you know, brand or something. So I think it's cool to collect drums. There I go using that word collect. <laughs> to acquire, acquire drums that you really believe you'll have a use for that make you want to play beats or make you want to record or make you want to rock out live or whatever. So yeah. I think that's, that's the thing to focus on. And that's the thing I preach is it, it doesn't matter, you know, if it's uh, $3,000 or $30, what matters is does it make you want to play? And if it makes you want to play, that's the important thing. Sometimes I go to a, like a, like a rehearsal space, you know, like some kind of place that has a totally beat up drum set there. And you go in, you rehearse with a band for three hours and that beat up snare with like dangling snare wires underneath and a dead drum head on top with pock marks in it sounds incredible. And I'm like, how is this thing like sounding so good? It makes me want to like steal it or something, but somehow that inspires you for the day. And I, I've, I've talked with all of my uh, drummer buddies about that. We all have that weird experience where you play some beat up kit that's out of tune and it just sounds incredible but maybe because it it's imperfect and it sounds different from the drums you have at home and it sounds like a drum loop from the 60s or something but um uh, that's that's kind of what we're looking for is uh inspiration creativity you know something that makes us um want to play more yeah so I, mean, I think that's that's what we should search that's what we should search for in gear not what we think we're supposed to have but what really makes us go oh yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think there are a lot of guys out there that are going to sound like them no matter what they're playing on. You know, I mean, oh, I, yeah. and I'm sure you've seen the, the videos, you know, the one that always comes to mind. You know, I saw a video of Benny Greb playing a SpongeBob SquarePants drum set, you know, like the little <laughs> child's toy. And it sounded like Benny Greb on a $39 yeah. drum set. And I was just like, wow, you know, I mean, I couldn't do that. <laughs> you know, yeah. Um, but I, to your point, it's whatever lights the muse in each of us is, is what we should be chasing. I, I agree wholeheartedly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we can we can experiment, and imitate what other people sounds, but they have to be true to yourself. You know, if you say, "I want that 
uh, Jay Bellrose vibe or I want that, you know, Steve Jordan vibe. You can kind of dip your toes in that water for a while, but as long as you're going to appropriate it and use it in your context, you, you know, you can't just be a chameleon imitating people with, you know, gear purchases. You have to say, like, I want a sharp pop and snare drum like he has, or I want a super, you know, smoky ride cymbal like Brian Blades, or I want, you know, you can, you can search for tones and frequencies, but in the end, it's got to somehow come back to your home base. Yeah, for sure. No doubt about it. Well, speaking of home base, that's kind of a great segue. Tell us all a little bit about your first big break. Um, you know, I, I know everybody's story is a little bit different, but, you know, I, I think you were pretty fresh out of college when your your first big gig came along. Tell us about that. Well, yeah, I had like a little like a, like a one, two, three kind of low little punch uh, when I was when I was still going to music school, the University of Miami, which was just also a fantastic experience. And so many really great drummers came out of there, too. And I just hung out with the drum professor, Steve Rucker, a couple of days ago. Um, when I was going there, I joined a band uh, that we got signed to a record label and it was called Fulano. And uh we uh, were on BMG, and we were, uh, recorded a record, we toured, and through that, I think that was my initial, like, big gig, quote-unquote. I don't think I made a ton of money off that gig, but I just had tons of good experiences, made great friends, uh, had to deal with the whole record label, publicist, <laughs> tour manager, all the, all the stuff that you start to see as you, you know, enter another level. But through that, I also met great producers, uh, great studio engineers, uh, all that stuff that I might not have met by just playing, you know, um, a, a, whatever, a jazz combo gig or a cover band gig that I was doing on the on the off night. By having that band, I, I was introduced to other areas of the music industry. And then uh, I was once doing a recording session in a studio for this producer that I had met, and someone called him up and asked for a piano player recommendation for uh, Julio Iglesias at the time, the guy Julio Iglesias. So, and I recommended a guy I knew. He asked me, who do you know? And I recommend this piano player, a friend of mine named Peter Wallace. And then he got the gig. And then two weeks later, they, they were looking for a drummer, and he returned the favor and recommended me. Wow. So that was my next big gig, was I, I went on tour with this guy Julio Iglesias for six months. Uh, and that was a big gig, because that's the first time I had in-ear monitors, uh, playing with one of those um, chairs with the with the woofer stuck to the chair, and uh, <laughs> you know, run, running sequences. I was running digital performer. I was hitting triggers. I, they had electronics. They had a drum cat, and I was I went from you know none of that to having to do all of it at once, and it was a great experience. And then uh, when I left that tour, I got called to do another session uh, in a different studio, Emilio Estefan Studio for a Colombian girl at the time named Shakira, who I didn't know that much. Uh, but she was there doing a record, and they wanted some live drum tracks, so I went and did that. I played on about half the record, and then when that record came out, they asked if I'd be part of the band, and that was 1998, and I've been doing that job ever since. So that's probably the big, big gig you're, you're referring to. Uh, was uh, It went kind of in that order, all in, in the course of maybe a year and a half. Uh, but that was a really important time for me was all those producers and songwriters and managers that I knew in that one circle kind of all helped me out a lot. And I'm still super grateful for that. Yeah, well, it doesn't get much bigger than, than Shakira. You know, I mean, if, if you're going to, you know, I, I, those tours, you know, and, and I know that you guys just just travel top notch. The, the tour is run top notch. But I mean, how much better could it get? I mean, really, you know, I mean, this is me just thinking out loud. You don't have to answer that unless you just want to. But um, that's awesome. You know, it it is awesome. You'd be surprised how much musicians complain. So if you ask them how much better it could get, they'd give you a list of 99 (laughs) other things. But uh, but but it is really nice. I mean, it's been a a great gig for all this time. Uh, I'm really I love the people here. We're, we're, we're family and it's, it's fun to do. And every time we go back out again, you know, just a barrel of laughs and it, it's, a, it's, it's really great. 
Sure, absolutely. Well, I I know that you do a lot of session work as well. So I I want to pick your brain for just a second. How different is it for you, uh, you know, for Brendan to go from being on a world tour with Shakira or, uh, you know, Tegan and Sarah or, or whomever you're out there touring with? Is it hard for you to flip the switch to go back into, OK, now I'm recording a pop record or a rock record and, and I have to get back into studio session, Brendan? Uh, I could see it being an issue if I played very differently for the two environments. Like maybe if I were like like some kind of freakazoid, bombastic, stick-twirling drummer live, and then I had to go super minimal, uh, you know, sensitive guy in the studio, maybe it'd be a lot harder. But I kind of play similarly in both environments. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, almost every gig I do, I'm playing with a click, either live or in the studio, so I get used to that. I always practice dynamics going from, you know, pianissimo to super loud, back and forth, both in the studio and live. I use similar setups. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. This Shakira drum set is out of control large. But for the most part, I play similar setups with the same seat height, the snares in the same spot, the toms are in the same spot. And I use a similar vocabulary on the drums. You know, my, my taste is similar. So I feel like for me, it's not that difficult to go back and forth. I could see other people having a real hard time because they have dramatically different styles live and in the studio, either dynamically or energetically or something. But uh, I kind of, you know what? I used to play with this percussionist live named Rafael Padilla, and he's one of my, the most important people in my life as far as a, a teacher and everything. But uh, he was a groove monster. And he used to tell me, like, every time we were going on stage to play a concert, he'd be like, okay, let's treat this like a two-hour recording session. Like, <laughs> meaning, like, we're not, we're not like, like, we're going for a take. And we're going to play this, like, as killer and as accurately as we can and groove our asses off as if it's a three-minute song, but it, it's actually two hours long. So I had that mentality, like, you know, we're going for a take. Like, it's going to be perfect from the beginning to the end. And, uh you know, with microphones and lights and cameras and everything. So I treated the live gigs with that kind of precision. So I think when I go into the studio, I already have that type of precision, uh, more or less. I think the difference lies where um, I think a performance in a concert is a little more about um, execution. Like we've already rehearsed the songs. We've rehearsed everything. Now it's about playing it you know, like we rehearsed it, you know, with those arrangements. I think the studio has a lot more to do with creativity. Like you come in with a blank slate and by the end of that session, you have to have a creative and appropriate drum part for that artist who's hiring you. So it's not only about precision. Everyone thinks about uh, a recording session is about how well can I play to a click, but that's just like, that's the first 15, 20%. So much of it now is about, what can you bring your, your immediate drum arrangement or your, uh, your drum tones that you're going to add to this song? Or are you replacing loops? Are you starting from scratch? Are you doing overdubs? And, uh, a lot of the top, top studio drummers in LA are not only good at grooving with a click, but they're very creative with their tones and with their musical drum parts. And they have a, a super, motivating attitude in the studio that helps people get through hurdles and speed bumps and like, Hey, we're almost there. Let's do this. How about this? And, you know, uh, so I believe the studio is a little bit more of a creative lab and uh, live. It's a little more about uh, executing a rehearsed show. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I, I do. I, I do know exactly what you're saying. And I think the, the, the idea of taking a live show and saying, OK, this is going to be a, you know, a 90 minute take in three minute slices. I think that's brilliant. You know, I've, I'd never thought of it that way, but that is brilliant. How when you're in the studio, how critical are you of yourself? In, in other words, when you go into the control room for a playback, do you go, nah, I, I can do better? Or do you just kind of leave that to the producer? Um, well, have you ever seen those movies where like someone's taking a, like a, 
like a leather bull whip and hitting themselves in the back, <laughs> like a uh, hundred lashes or something. I think it, mentally, mentally, that's going on inside during every playback. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, I'm like, gosh, that could be better. That could be better. That's a stupid drum fill. I got to go <laughs> redo that drum fill or whatever. But I also know that it's not about me. It's about what the producer and the artist like in the end. I have to, I have to take a backseat to what they like. So if I do one take and they love it, they're like, oh my God, it's perfect. And I'm like, I can't stand that drum fill I did in the third chorus. I have to keep my mouth shut because I don't want to kill the vibe. And I'm like, it's good enough. It's in time, whatever. Just let it go. Because I, okay, I have a studio of my own uh, and I do a lot of drum tracks remotely. And man, well, I do, I'll do eight takes, I'll do 12 takes, I'll do 18 takes until I like it. Yeah. And I realize what, 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 what uh, satisfies me is way pickier than what satisfies a songwriter or producer for the most part. Because I hear everything that I would like to improve. Uh, I will change the snare drum tuning, you know, you know four times. I'll experiment with different drum fills going into the bridge till I find the one that I think floats the best you know oh, that one goes great with the vocal melody right there and, and I'll, I'll just mess around with all sorts of, of things because it's just me when I'm in a studio it's a group effort so you have you can't kill the vibe by being super persnickety you have to say okay everyone's happy we have to move on they have to do background vocals and violin overdubs I can't sit there and say oh, I don't know I don't know it's not a good not a good idea so Really, you have to, from the beginning, you have to start thinking about the idea that this might be the one they'll like, so, so um, you know, be prepared to let go. Uh, I will use some sort of, uh, how can I say it, like, psychologically, politically correct ways of saying stuff, like, if everyone's super jones on a take, like, oh, it's great, everyone's high-fiving, and, and then I'll say, I love it, too. You know what, could I give you an alternate? That's what I say. I'm like, hey, can I give you just like an alternate take. Uh, you guys don't have to do it, but can I just do a, an overdub of myself? Really? So, and I'll do another take. Just saying, I just want to hear myself do something different. Uh, it's, the first one's great though. And yeah. I'll do another one. And then everyone's like, wow, that one was pretty good too. And I like that drum fill you did into the bridge. I'm like, you do? Okay, well maybe we should go B then for me, you know? So I didn't kill A. Everyone loved it. But then I secretly said, I just feel like doing another one. I'm still learning the song. And I do another take. And then if it's better, everyone will realize it. If it's not better, no harm done. We'll go at A, you know? Yeah, that's or, you know, nowadays you can comp between playlists. So you can say, let's just use all of A and use that drum fill I did going into the bridge on my second take. We can put that in and then it's the, the Uber take, you know? It's great. Right. Well, it, and that's easy to do when you're, you know, when you're playing with a click and snapping everything to the grid, you, you can do that, you know? So Exactly. I, but I think that's a, a, a great approach to it. Now, in the same vein, how critical are you now listening to stuff you recorded 20 years ago? You know, do you listen back to, to that early Shakira stuff and go, oh, my God, Brendan? Or do you say, well, that's where I was at as a player 20 years ago? Surprisingly, as critical as I am, it's more of the second. It's more I'm, I'm accepting as that's where I was. And sometimes I'm surprised I, I wasn't worse. I'm like, Wow. <laughs> That's not as bad as I thought it would be. <laughs> I mean, a friend of mine sent a friend of mine sent me a a recording of my band in high school, and I was just ready to just like listen to it and laugh my ass off about how bad it was, and it wasn't that bad. I'm like, wait a second. Yeah. That's not a, nearly as horrible as I thought it would be. I mean, uh, so. There are things where I'm like, wow, that's funny. You can really tell what I was listening to back then. I was super going through my Bonham phase or I was going through my Steve Jordan phase. Or I was going through my Matt Chamberlain phase. I can really hear who I was going through that year sometimes by the drum fills I decided to do or my tuning or whatever. But um, I don't, I guess maybe because I always had that, um, how can I say it? I was always really focused on my precision on recording that nothing sounds like horrible mistakes to me. Uh, it just sounds like, Oh, that's cute. Uh, what I was trying to do there. That was a nice, uh, <laughs> funny attempt. Yeah, I guess it's kind of like if you go through your iPhoto library over the past 20 years and you look at all your different hairstyles, and you're like, that one's not bad. 
that was a terrible idea. Yeah. Well, that's funny. You know, who, who, who thought that a blue mohawk would look good? All right. Well, that's, <laughs> that, was that, that was that year, and that was kind of a, a nice attempt at, you know, something. But I feel like sometimes I listen to my drumming, and, I, and I'm like, well, that could have been more adventurous. That sounded a little too safe, or that's not the most appropriate uh, beat for that song. I could tell now, or, wow, I wish I used brushes instead of whatever on that song, but whatever, now I know. And, yeah, it's it's. You, I mean, I'm pretty sure that everyone goes through that. Like, uh, they they have a combination of um, uh, nostalgia and remorse for what they did 20 years ago. Well, yeah, I mean, I th- I touche. I mean, I think everybody uh, does go through that. And you know, I, personally, I've been going through you know kind of my first you know big band. Uh, we released our first record 20 years ago and we've kind of been going through remixing some of that stuff to make it actually sound modern. We're going to do a 20 anniversary, 20 year anniversary release uh, digitally. It was never released to iTunes and Spotify and all that. And when I listen back to the drum tracks, I go, well, you know, that's not as bad as it could have been. <laughs> you know, I, I, that's beautiful. I, I could have done that a whole lot worse than I did. You know, I mean, I, yeah. I think that's just how we have to approach it as a drummer. Now, out on the road right now with with Shakira, are you getting board tapes every night? Are you listening to your performances as you're on the road? Or do you just say, no, nah, I'm going to the next gig? You know, I do a little bit of that. Uh, I'm still a bit nerdy about drumming, and uh, the front house guy has a little, um, you know, USB key drives. You know that that, and he'll he has the entire show on one of those. And if I bother him, he'll give it to me every night, and I'll throw it into my laptop and I'll listen to it. Um, but a lot of it is um, I play it pretty similarly every night, so there's not uh, a lot to. Uh, to analyze it at a certain extent. But uh, when I videotape stuff, man, um, <laughs> I, 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 I bought a used GoPro last year. I was borrowing one from a friend of mine named Christopher Alice. Uh, he lent me two GoPros for like a year and, and then he finally needed it back. So I went and I, on eBay, I found one super cheap and I bought one. I threw it up behind me and that's a lot more fun for me to check out because I'm getting not only audio, but I'm also seeing mechanics like a lot of like positioning, what is my wrist doing here? What is my back doing here? You know, what is my head doing here when I play that? Um, so I really get into not only the, the drum parts and the grooves and, the, and the, the feel, but I also get into what does my, what do my limbs and my body look like when I'm playing these different songs? And can I improve that also? Uh, because that's a whole other thing that, you know, that you can work on besides just how well do you play in time or how well do you play, you know, the drums. It's like, how does my body move? Uh, biomechanics. You know, I know my friend Dave Elish just released a video series on his biomechanics. Yeah. And he got super, super into it, you know? And, and I, I think that's something that is important if you really want to go down that route. I mean, some guys have the worst technique and they sound incredible. And I'm like, so be it. Don't worry about it. Don't go change him. But I, on the other hand, I'm fascinated with, um, you know, the physical side of drumming and, and, you know, what a little twist of the wrist can do to your ghost notes or your rim shot or whatever. And, uh, and, uh, the way you lean forward or lean back and how that affects your pedal technique and all these things are kind of fascinating for me and might be annoying for everyone else. Uh, so I like watching, some of these shows and really analyzing what's going on. Like when I go to reach for that second floor, Tom or whatever. Yeah. So I, I do that more than I listen to board tapes now. Well, I mean, it just shows that you're a student of the game, you know, and, and you're, you're constantly trying to improve, um, which, you know, if you're a good musician, not just a, a drummer, but if you're just a, a good musician that cares, you're always trying to up your game. And, you know, when I was a kid, I remember reading, you know, Modern Drummer and, and the great Omar Hakim was talking about, you know, his, his gig. Uh, I think he was playing with Sting at the time. And he was like, there you will see me lean forward in certain sections because it causes me to play a little different, a little more, you know, in uh, on top of the beat. And if it needs to slow down, you'll see me lean back. You know, I mean, just little things like that, that as a 
as a kid starting out, you don't think about. But as yeah. we as we get older, you know, I'm getting to the age where I really have to watch my mechanics or I'm going to hurt the next day. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, so yeah, I, I, I love that stuff. And if you could, if someone asks you who your five favorite drummers are and you list five different drummers and they all play with different bands, they've had different careers, they have different drum sounds or setups, but also they all fit differently too and they all hit differently. And I love that aspect of it. I love, like, wow, what's the difference between the way this guy approaches the drum set and the way this guy approaches the drum set? Just from even the drum throne and his posture alone is, is I can just get into that for a while, let alone their tuning and their influences and their style and their vocabulary. Uh, this is, see, we're going down super nerdyville, but I, I, I love this stuff. And, um, you well, know, but super uh, nerdyville is, I, I mean, you know, it, it's the premise of this show for, for the most part, <laughs> you know, I mean, it really is. And, and, you know, I try to approach it as what would the 13 year old Jamie have you know what would i have wanted to know from brendan buckley when i was a year into drumming you know kind of thing and you know one of my all-time favorite drummers um you know went to the university of miami and that's the the great rod morgenstein i love oh, rod yeah. i mean he's one of my top five all-time favorite drummers and you know i was lucky enough to have him on the show and you know I, but i think about guys like him who has you know, super technical. His technique is great. His posture is wonderful. And then at the same time, you know, I can say Tommy Lee is one of my all time favorite drummers. And, you know, he's got good technique, but I mean, he looks like, I don't know, like an alien back there playing, you know, I mean, it's not, sure. it doesn't come from a learned place for him. I don't think, you know? Yeah, and he's super lanky and swinging all over the place, but it comes out great. I mean, his drumming is fantastic, too. Yeah. Uh, and I, I love that. I love that there can be so many ways to um, to approach the same instrument. I mean, I don't know if you're into sports, but I watch a lot of sports, and I, 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 I always have a analogies between sports guys and drummers and things. And if you, even if you watch guys back in baseball, and there's guys who are like, they're fantastic, you know, 400 hitters and stuff that all hold the bat differently. They all like cock their foot a little differently as the ball's coming. And if you figure there was only one way to do it, everyone would be doing it that way by now. <laughs> well, exactly. around for over a hundred years, but there's obviously different ways to do it. And each guy has their own way of doing it. That helps them, you know, hit the ball more often or be more accurate or pull it to the right, the correct side of the field or hit it over the fence. And I think drums are the same way. If there's only one way to do it, by now everyone would have figured that out and they're all doing it the same way. But they, each guy finds a different way to do it that helps them get over whatever they need to get over and, uh, or it comes from different styles or different teachers or whatever. And uh, I, I, I love that. I love the variety and I love the different approaches. And I remember you were talking about, um, again, like uh, posture and things like that. I, I Two of my favorite, favorite, favorite drummers of all time would be like Tony Williams and Steve Gadd. And I remember seeing VHS tapes of both of them when I was a very young, influential drummer. And, I mean, was it? No, not influential, young, well, easily influenced drummer. And, um, and um, Tony Williams, he said, you know, you've got to learn how to sit on your stool correctly or else you're not using your, you know, your energy correctly. You know, if you're leaning all the time, you're getting in the way of yourself. And then Steve Gadd said, you know, something, not the same thing, but he was talking about on the verse, I kind of lean a little more this way. Then when I, when I get to the chorus, I kind of lean a little more this way, which is kind of like that, um, that Omar Hakim thing, that he ch it changes his feel when he, when he does a little like, crouch here and then sits a little more straight here. I mean, right. it actually affects his pocket in a way that is musical. And it blew my mind that guys would be thinking about this kind of stuff when I was just trying to learn how to stay in time you know uh, <laughs> yeah 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 and i you know on, only recently i realized that you know how i sit is affecting uh my bass drum technique not just the angle of the seat i mean the, the height of the seat or something but even, even if I, I the seat's all set i'm sitting in the same spot if i lean forward i put a little bit more weight over my feet and when i lean back i alleviate some of the weight on my feet and i can play differently so yeah. That's what I mess with sometimes in the middle of a song. I just adjust something just to see how it feels. And, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I think 
I think we all do that to a certain extent. You know, I don't know that I would be doing it on a world tour with Shakira, but you know, <laughs> that's your thing, Brendan. Um, you yeah. know, uh, I, but I think it's amazing that, uh, you know, and very useful for our listeners to hear somebody like yourself say, you know, these are the things that I'm thinking about all the time. You know, how do I, you know, how do I keep pushing myself up the ladder, so to speak? And, um, you know, I, I'm just, you know, I, I joked around with you when, when we first got on the phone, you know, just reading through your, your resume, I said, save some for the rest of us, you know, <laughs> because you've just played with everybody. And one in particular that I want to ask you about, you know, I, I know you did some, some uh, performing with Jackson Brown. You got to tell us about that because Jackson Brown is just like a national treasure at this point. You know, to, tell me about that gig. Okay, that was very small, very small. It's, I put it really far down on my resume because I only did two gigs with him. But that, that came from that percussionist I talked about named Rafael Padilla, who was, um, I did the Shakira tour with him. He, he used to play with uh, Gloria Stefan for many years, the Miami Sound Machine, and he's a super, uh, superhuman recording session percussionist in L.A., and um, when I first moved to L.A., he was integral for me moving to L.A. because I was living in Miami at the time. And he's like, dude, you got to move to L.A. And I'm like, I don't know. There's so many good drummers there. And he's like, no, you got to come out. You know, it's, you know, it's the next step for you. So I did it. I moved out because of him. And I was there for like two weeks. And he got me a gig with uh, this singer for Mr. Mr. named Richard Page. Oh, yeah, sure. And, and Jackson Brown. They were doing like these two benefit concerts. And that's what I did. Uh, he, uh, and, uh, and I only found out afterwards that it was cause Vinny Caliuta couldn't do it. They got me and I'm like, wait, no, 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 this is not, an, <laughs> this is not an, this is not an equivalent. There should be like <laughs> 900 people in between us that, but somehow again, it's sometimes who, you know, so, uh, the band was like ultra incredible band of, uh, LA greats. And I had just gotten there and I felt like I was totally out of my league, but it was a great experience anyway. And, uh, Richard Page was super on it, very professional, um, uh, just came early, we rehearsed, and Jackson Brown was almost, I don't want to say he was unprofessional, but he just kind of rolled in, just barely did a sound check, said, man, I can't really hear myself, and I'm, my voice is a little weak today, so you know, maybe we'll cut this a little early, and I'm like, wow, what's going on with this? And then he came back to the gig and destroyed it, I and mean, it sounded <laughs> unbelievable, and I'm like, well, that's a pro. As a pro, he doesn't need the sound check. He doesn't even to hear himself in the monitors. He just comes and kills it. So uh, I was, I was just honored to even get to play with him twice. You know, that was that was it. I didn't do any like full tours or uh, recording sessions with him or anything like that. Well, I, you know, I, if I were you, I would put it right under Shakira on your website in your <laughs> resume. I mean, it's Jackson Brown, man. Come on. Yeah. I mean, what what a cool gig. Now, one other that that I do want to ask you about, and I want to be respectful of your time, but you've got the Bodines listed on your resume. And the last time I saw the Bodines, the the great, the, the Mr. I am everywhere there are drums, Kenny Aronoff was with them. Um, tell me a little bit about that gig. Was Kenny not available and, and, and you subbed for him or how did that work? Yeah, fortunately, a lot of my friends are super busy. So I get to work when they're very busy. And uh, Kenny Aronoff, uh, he, do, he, was, he does that gig and John Fogarty at the same time. So I, I was subbing for Kenny Aronoff because he does that. That's one of his main gigs is the Bodines. So I'm friends with the bassist for the Bodines. His name's Eric Holden. Uh, I've done tons of different gigs with him over the years, uh, different pop and rock artists and some, lots of recording sessions. So he's super good to me. So he was the one who proposed the idea that, hey, there's some dates that Kenny can't do. Uh, would you like to do them? I'm like, are you kidding me? I'd love to. So I got to learn the set and come out and do uh, the fill-in for any of the dates that Kenny Arnoff was double booked. And uh, I tell you, to be in L.A. and to be the runner-up for gigs is a <laughs> great, great place to be, honestly. It's not like, I say this all the time, when you go to an audition and you come in second place, that's fantastic. Yeah. When you are, when someone calls you up and says, hey, we're looking at you and another guy to do this gig or this tour, this session, it's a great place to be because it means that you're going to be the guy they call when the other guy can't do it. 
and you become sort of part of this circle of peers that all become, I don't want to say the word interchangeable because it's not interchangeable, but you all fill in for each other. And that's a perfect spot to be in rather than to go out and say, I want everything or I'm going to beat everyone. It's better to live in LA and say, I just want to be part of this circle of really, really great successful drummers. And if I could just get a 10th of the work that they get, then I'm going to be doing pretty well. So, uh, I feel like that's a, that's part of, um, one of, I guess, my calling cards or something is I'm a really good sub for other people. I can learn music really quickly and I can fill in for people and, and just do a good job and then slip away again. <laughs> and I, and, uh, that's, I really feel like I've gotten a lot of great gigs just by having that quality also is just being like, uh, uh, top notch sub for other people. And, uh, yeah. I, I don't, I don't, I don't greedily try to steal their gig away from them or anything. I'm just like, I'm just happy to be here for a week or two days or a month or whatever it is. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, that's a, a fantastic attitude to have. And, you know, like you said, you know, when you're, when you're subbing for Kenny, you know, that's a little bit different than, you know, the, the blues cover band that does Tuesday night at the coffee shop. You, you know what I'm saying? You're you're subbing at a at a different level than a guy like me, you know, w- w- without a doubt. So uh, so kudos to you, um, Brendan. You know, one of our traditions here on, on the drum shuffle is we always ask our guests for a good piece of advice. And, you know, your career, um, you know, you, you have so much good stuff ahead of you. So so two things here. Share with us what is next for Brendan or what you hope to be next for you. And then share with us a good piece of advice that we can take out to, to our gigs or, or in our day to day life, whatever you'd like it to be. Ah, uh, well, let me see if I can wrap this up in something that's not uh, long-winded and 45 minutes long. I guess <laughs> next next is I'm, I'm uh, obviously I'm mid-tour with Shakira, but I'm already thinking about what happens when this one wraps up because that's what I have to do as a freelance artist. So I have several gigs that are uh, uh, starting when this one finishes up. Uh, so I have those on hold. Uh, like uh, this Asian pop artist and this uh, uh, another singer songwriter named Daniel Powder. I have these two gigs kind of filling up uh, the majority of 2019. But I also like to, I mean, despite what it might look like, uh, there's things outside of drumming. Like I have a wife and a son and I'm thinking about, you know, family stuff too and domestic stuff and uh, what am I going to do with them? throughout the remainder of the year and throughout the remainder of next year. So that's what I have. Uh, the, the two things I'm thinking about are what happens when this gig ends and what do I do with the rest of my life also when this gig ends. Um, and as far as um, suggestions or advice, uh, I, I know we were joking before we started that usually what I tell people at drum clinics or seminars or something is, um, uh, you know, you got to work hard and, and, and not be a jerk. But I mean, that's pretty much what everyone says nowadays. That's so I would say, uh, really in every scenario, you just do a good job. If you do a good job, uh, and you walk away, then that will always lead to something else. Uh, I'm always thinking about, you know, a job well done, whether it's one gig, one recording session, one two year tour, um, whatever. And, and outside of music too, uh, it could be whatever dealing with your landscaper or, you know, going to the bank, or whatever. I'm always trying to represent myself in a way where I feel like job well done and, you know, bring positivity and good energy and stuff. And that seems to lead to something better all the time. Uh, just be good, do a good job, work hard, and you'll be astonished with the results that happen if you just have that type of attitude. Yeah, those are wonderful words of, of wisdom, Brendan. And, and, you know, that's one of the things that, that I really appreciate about you is you always have something positive to say. You know, I mean, I've read many interviews that you've done. I've listened to other other podcasts that you've been on. You always have a positive spin on everything. And, and quite honestly, the music business needs more guys like you. You know, I, I mean, that, that's that's my opinion, certainly. Um 
Brendan, it goes without saying, we've barely scratched the surface with you. You are welcome on this show anytime your schedule will allow. Thank you so much for for spending an hour with us on your day off on tour. I know those don't come very often, so we are very appreciative that you chose to spend an hour with us today talking. Uh, Come back and see us real soon, would you? I would love that. You know, it's never a difficult thing to sit around and chat about drums. It's, uh, I think that most drummers you'll find, uh, love to do that. So, uh, life and drums, it's, it's a fun topic for me. And if I helped anyone out at all today, that's great. If I offended everyone, I apologize. And, uh, <laughs> I would, I would, I love what you do. So I, I encourage you to keep doing it and thank you for doing it and providing this forum for people to chat and learn. And uh, I, anytime you want to do a, a episode two for me, I'd be honored. Awesome. Well, we will get that scheduled very soon. Folks, it is brendanbuckley.com. Go visit his website. Go see him playing with Shakira. They are halfway done with their tour. Tickets are available. Pick them up. Go see him. Brendan, thank you so much, buddy. We'll talk to you very, very soon, okay? All right. Thanks, Jamie. All right. See ya. All right, folks, that's going to wrap up episode 31 of the Drum Shuffle. Thank you so much for tuning in. As always, we cannot do this without every single one of you. Uh, I am very pleased to report today that uh, our interview from a couple weeks back with Jerry Gaskell um, got picked up on the front page of blabbermouth.net. So uh, that was a big shock to, to me anyway. Uh, and we, uh, our listenership has just increased fourfold overnight because of that. So uh, whichever one of you guys out there shared that story with them, I certainly appreciate that. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button on whatever platform you're using to listen in today. We certainly appreciate that. You do not want to miss some of the guests that we have coming up on future episodes of the Drum Shuffle. Next week, I'm going to be joined by the great Grant Menifee. Grant, of course, uh, is a fabulous educator up in the Baltimore area. Uh, and it, quite honestly, drum teacher to the stars. Uh, some of his former students uh, include uh, Matt Halpern from uh, Periphery, Nate Morton from The Voice. So we're going to have a great conversation with Grant next week, and you're not going to want to miss that. As always, we love hearing from you throughout the week. Our email address is the drum shuffle podcast at gmail.com. Our web address is the drum And you can find more information on me at jamieeads.com. Also, on a personal note, I want to thank each and every one of you that has reached out to me over the past couple of weeks. Of course, I lost my mother back on August 10th, and uh, I heard from quite a few of you guys that had heard that news through social media and various outlets. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for your heartfelt condolences over the past couple of weeks. So until next time, may your head stay strong and your sticks never break. Cheers. Cheers.